Hi, John Boyd. Hey, Alexandra Horn. Here we are with a new episode of Behind the Books from IVP Academic. In this episode, Lynn is interviewing contributor Helen Ree. And something that's exciting about this episode is that Helen's contribution is a brand new article of the Dictionary of Paul and His Letters. The first edition 30 years ago did not have this article. Yeah, it's Wealth and Poverty is the title of it. And it's not that wealth and poverty weren't discussed 30 years ago, but... Scholarship is advanced, and uh, this time around, we needed a whole article on it. There's a lot of topics like that. 95% of the content in the second edition is totally brand new. And even when they have the same article headline, they're all new. But this is one that just is uh, completely fresh. There's other things like it. There's articles on disability in Paul, on cruciformity, which we talked about two episodes ago, various contextual interpretations, women named in Paul, Paul and politics, all kinds of stuff like that. But this is an exciting one because wealth and poverty are important. As the saying goes, show us the money. That's one of the fun things about this second edition. And we heard from the volume editors in the first episode of all of the work of putting together this massive tome. There's a lot of articles. There's a lot that's new, 95%. That's a lot. But there's also a lot of contributors. In fact, there's over 140 contributors, which I'll just say that feels like a lot of administration and a lot of herding of cats. You are not kidding. Honestly, a significant percentage of the editorial team's work on this was just keeping track of everybody who's involved. Where are they at? What have they turned in? What have they revised? It's one of those little hidden things about the publishing business that our job is to make it look easy in the end. When you're reading the book, you shouldn't have to think about all that administration at all. But that means, you know, to make anything look easy, you got to do hard work. Yeah. And it's a heavy job on the IVP editor. It's a heavy job on the volume editors, Scott, Lynn, and Nijay, to be really organized and on top of it. So I tip my hat to them. Right. Their genius went into all the networks of knowing who's the right scholar to write what article. We're super grateful for everything they did. And in this case, Lynn Kohick is the perfect person to interview Helen Ray, And it's quite a conversation. As Lynn and Helen dive into the conversation of wealth and poverty, there's a lot of takeaways. How were Christians different than the Roman Empire in the first century? What does that look like for us today? How is the church particularly defined by some of these dynamics and not peripherally influenced by them? Right. And it's super cool how Dr. Ree talks about the generosity of the early church. Paul's influence in uh, challenging Christians to shape their charities, shape their financial life together, and in fact, to shape the whole church so that it serves the poor. So whether it's the work of putting together a volume like this or the work of implementing the imperatives of scripture, particularly those on wealth and poverty that we can find in Pauline epistles. The work is heavy, but it is meaningful and we're in it. Yeah, this is just the kind of conversation we want to have. Enjoy this episode with Lynn Kohick interviewing Helen Ree. Well, I'm excited to be talking with one of the contributors to the Dictionary of Paul and his letters, the second edition. I'm talking with Helen Ree, who teaches at Westmont College. Helen, thank you so much for talking with us about your own journey as a scholar. And specifically, we'll be digging into the contribution that you made to the Dictionary of Paul and His Letters on wealth and poverty. So I'm really looking forward to that. But welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, It's a pleasure and honor to be invited and uh, look forward to our time together. Thank you. Well, there was a time, Dr. Ree, when you weren't Dr. Ree, you were Helen. (laughs) Can you tell us a little bit about your journey into scholarship? What attracted you to this academic life? Yeah, thank you for that question. Growing up, I loved learning history and Christian faith for me and church life was a very integral part of who I am and who I was. And the initial interest to academic sort of or the idea of sort of academia came from my love for the subject, particularly when I was in seminary. I uh, fell in love with the New Testament and then church history. I was a history major in college, so I was thinking about what might be my calling and how I can utilize what 
God has gifted me, hopefully, to the greater audience. And uh, so thinking through all of these, I think it took years of sort of uh, owning that sense of calling in my life and constantly also wrestling with, is this uh, really the area that I can contribute? Because sometimes there is a self-doubt. And so sometimes there's a great sense of sort of a hope, but through the encouragement of many mentors, I went to Fuller and David Scholler was my supervisor and he modeled uh, sort of what it means to be a scholar who also is uh, deeply rooted in faith and church and concern for others. So through the modeling, you know, he really kind of exemplified the kind of scholar that I would love to be and gave me the hope and the encouragement that I could sort of start that journey slowly but surely. That's wonderful. Yes. And now you uh, you have a chance to do the same with your students at Westmont College in the Southern California area, same area as Fuller, which is fun. In your teaching, um, have you used the Dictionary of Paul and his letters, the first edition, or the Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels? Was that formative in your own scholarship and teaching? Yes. So Dictionary of Paul and his letters came out in 1993, I believe. And then Dictionary of Jesus and the Gospels came around maybe slightly before. I started my seminary in 1994. So I remember actually David, I think, required that as part of text when I took his New Testament intro, you know, the second part of the New Testament introduction. And then the also, um, I also took his uh, first part of uh, New Testament introduction, Gospels. So I became very familiar with the universities, two dictionaries, and then David would talk about it as a sort of the compendium of the most up-to-date and helpful and comprehensive Christian scholarship and New Testament scholarship, particularly for evangelicals of that time. So that was very formative. They were my go-to sources whenever I started a research, particularly I really appreciated their recent up-to-date sort of bibliographies at the end and the size of each article, I mean, depending on the, the subject, but very manageable. And yet there's also depth as well as comprehensive sort of analysis of the topic. So I uh, was very grateful to have those resources at my hand. Oh, and isn't it exciting that now you've also contributed Having mm-hmm. shared your yeah. story, and I resonate with with your sense of, you know, can I do this? Maybe self-doubt, that sort of thing in the process. And yet now here in the second edition, you contributed. That's so exciting. Yeah, it was very gratifying to be asked uh, to contribute and then glad that it came out and then um, really grateful for, yeah, the, all the scholarships sort of uh, that's represented there. Yes, yes. Well, and your particular contribution is Wealth and Poverty, and you've written on this subject in book length, so I'm sure it was (laughs) hard to shrink it down to uh, a dictionary article, but I'm so glad you did. You've packed so much into this. Um, Before I dive into kind of specific questions with the essay, can you just give us maybe a brief understanding of, or what are maybe some of the things we should keep in mind when we think about this big topic of wealth and poverty, not just in Paul's letters, but let's say in the early centuries of the church, uh, why why these wealth and poverty, these categories should be important for us? Yeah, thank you for that question, because I really wanted to highlight that the wealth and poverty issues uh, involving wealth and poverty, how to use wealth and um, so on. These sort of uh, subjects and the issues are not the peripheral uh, issues to Christian faith, but from the very early church and on, those are integral part of understanding the grace of Jesus Christ and uh, the Christian ministry from the very beginning. So that's the sort of a big part of what I really wanted to highlight, particularly in our understanding of salvation, the end times or eschatology, uh, the understanding of how heavenly wealth, that how that really affects our relationship with our earthly wealth. And 
how early Christians really, to an extent, defined themselves as a people who are generous, people who care for the poor because of their fundamental faith in Jesus Christ. And that's part of a very important part of uh, Christian ministry. Yes, yes. I'm familiar a little bit with some of the leading women in uh, the early church, 4th, 5th century, who used their wealth. They happened to have great wealth, and they used it to help build churches and to help sponsor research or support the efforts of, let's say, a Jerome or an Augustine or that sort of thing, very involved in their churches and felt that the money should be used in this way and not kept to themselves. Yeah. What was the, I'm going to ask one more question. We're kind of geeking out here before we dive into the essay, but since I have you here, this is the Christian way of doing things. How did that contrast with the larger Roman expectation for how someone used their wealth? What did the Romans do? Yeah, great question. So Romans, I would say there was no general sort of a welfare organization in the Roman Empire, but there was definitely a sort of a almsgiving, but mainly actually through patronage, as you uh, know very well. So particularly Roman, wealthier Roman were expected to give or contribute to the cities or, um, you know, provide uh, games or, you know, chariot races and sort of a civic sort of a patronage and then give handouts to their clients. And so, so that's very hierarchical sort of a system. And then Paul uses the word cheerful givers and second Corinthians, but there were actually cheerful givers among the Romans as well. But the the reason for their cheerful giving was to receive honor, right? So that was an expected sort of return for their giving. What was expected was, uh, you know, political support or praise, right? Recognition. So all of that. But for Christian sort of uh, giving in Luke, Jesus actually turns the table on Greco-Roman sort of a patronage and the expectation for return by saying, when you actually go out, invite people, invite these kinds of people, the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, those who cannot repay you. So I think one of the distinctions between Christian giving and the Roman giving per se, is that giving without expectation or giving because we were given much. Heavenly Father will reward us at the eschaton, but that's not up to us how we should receive, but it's the Father's sort of generosity, but how we can actually sort of channel God's generosity to others without particular expectation for honor or glory or praise. I think it's one of the distinguishing factors from Roman giving from Christian giving. Yeah, that's so good. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And so in your essays, we dive into that. I want to highlight a section where you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 and following, where <laughs> I would say uh, the Christians there in Corinth are not understanding the Christian way of thinking about wealth and honor. And Paul has some sharp words for them. Can you talk a little bit about how to best understand 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 17 and following? I think it's a passage many of us are familiar with because some of the language we use in our communion services. But there's more going on, isn't it? So yeah, walk us through this passage to help us understand it more faithfully. Yeah. So from Paul's perspective, it's a sort of very serious sort of breach of what it means to be body of Christ, right? Especially when there are different sort of, uh, you know, coming from the different sort of uh, socioeconomic sort of ranks, uh, what the Corinthians actually did in 1 Corinthians 11 was a disregard for those who are poorer or the less wealthier brothers and sisters by eating up or consuming apparently sort of that's a larger meal situation there. So their act represented very unchristian. That their act really followed the very Greco-Roman ways of distinguishing people in a socioeconomic ways and not being considerate. So in that way, if we uh, want to really follow Christ, actually, commandment of love and example. We should wait 
and when until everyone gets here and then partake the meal together because that might imply those who cannot actually be there on time or early that they didn't have the time for leisure they probably were obligated to their work so which also then implies and means that those who were there earlier actually had those kinds of leisure and the privilege and then they were not being considerate to the greater body of Christ. So when we proclaim, uh, it says, in order for the Corinthians to truly proclaim Christ's death through the Lord's Supper, community should come together in unity and show their genuine concern for each other through their actions, particularly to the poor. So that's how I understand the passage. Yeah, I so often in my church we would say, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We're familiar with that. Verse 24 and 25, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And then when you get further down, like verse 27, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. And so we were invited to silently pray and reflect on our sins that week or that month or whenever prior to taking communion last so that we could confess them. And then in verse 29, those who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment on themselves. And in that case, in the Greek, we don't have body of Christ, we just have body. And I wonder if Paul is here doing kind of a wordplay on body of Christ, meaning the Eucharist elements, the physical body of Christ that was on the cross for us that he's referencing in that, and the body of Christ that is the congregation. Right. I wholeheartedly actually agree that there is actually the double meaning behind that body. So sorry that I could have been actually a little more specific sort of there, but the body actually there to me represents both not only the actual you know bread or shared sort of Eucharistic elements, but also the greater body of Christ, because there is no specific sort of reference, but you could actually provide the sort of a deeper meaning in that. It's such a powerful verse, isn't it? I mean, the whole passage where he challenges them, you know, do you despise, this is in 22, do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? I mean, to your earlier point, it's not only a doctrinal question, it's also a socioeconomic question, as you pointed out earlier, right? Just not taking account of those who don't have resources, can't get to the agape meal on time, and so they go away hungry. Or maybe even sick. And maybe we'll pick that up a little bit later when we talk about your new book out that looks at illness and healthcare in early Christianity. But in Corinth, it appears that some people are weak enough because of lack of nutrition that they're getting sick. Verse 30, some of you are weak and sick. And it's like the some other people in Corinth aren't even noticing that. So yeah, so your your essay brought this out so well. There is another part in the essay where you drill down, and that is in Galatians 2, where the Jerusalem apostles are talking with Paul, and they encourage Paul to remember the poor, which Paul says he's happy to do. What's going on with that? What's that reference to remember, or what do you think it's referring to there, remember the poor? So remember the poor, I consider that as a sort of a Paul's overarching the poor there is not just a specific sort of a poor in uh, Galatia or the, you know, in that context, but the poor are the general poor everywhere we see. So that's actually how Longenecker, Bruce actually interpret that in his book, Remember the Poor. That sort of provides the sort of overarching theme for uh, including his Paul's collection efforts. Yes. Talk a little bit about that, too, as you're answering with Galatians 2. Yeah. Right. So painstakingly, Paul is painstakingly pointing out how important that collection efforts are for the Jerusalem saints who are socioeconomically challenged in a challenged situation and poor. And not only that symbolizes the unity between the Jews and Greeks, but that is an act of worship using the cultic language. This is another sort of a incident or the reference So according to David Downs, the Jerusalem collection is an act of worship. This is where the liturgical or the worship sort of a language of act of worship 
intersects with our ministry to the poor. So what, you know, people sometimes actually make a distinction, oh, that's a social uh, ministry or physical sort of ministry as though that's not spiritual enough or that doesn't have a bearing upon our relationship with God. But what we do to our neighbors, uh, particularly the poor neighbors, always have impacts how we actually approach and express uh, God's grace unto us. And because we have already received from God, God's grace, remembering the poor is a natural sort of uh, avenue through which we preach the gospel. So the gospel preached, proclaimed, should be expressed through gospel embodied. So I take the, remember the poor as Paul's expression of the gospel embodied aspect as a result of his ministry uh, of proclaiming the gospel. Oh, that's so good. Yes, I love that. You and I are college professors, so we did not necessarily pick a job that pays a lot of money, but we certainly have our needs met, for which we are grateful. What are your estimates of, or what are the latest estimates on the Pauline communities about their wealth and or poverty? You spend some time, it's so helpful, you have some graphs in the essay. What do we even mean when we talk about someone who is wealthy in a Pauline community? Because it certainly would look different then than what we think of wealthy today. Can you talk a little bit about the makeup of these communities? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I think still the sort of the most foundational work uh, has been given uh, by Steve Friesen and Bruce Longenecker in sort of mapping out the socioeconomic sort of a map of the Roman Empire uh, sort of approximately during the time of Paul. So according to them, we, you know, say... If you are wealthy in the Pauline community, is uh, to be able to provide a space for their house church gathering place. That would be, um, you know, uh, whether it be, um, you know, Philemon or, you know, uh, in Acts or Lydia or so. Um, there is some little bit sort of a difference between uh, Steve and Bruce, uh, how they sort of, um, you know, in terms of sort of percentage of the population. But Paul in Paul's community, per se, I don't think there is any sort of a elite Roman elite sort of a population represented there, even though in Acts, you know, when he went to Berea and then, you know, different sort of cities, uh, there are prominent citizens of those regions uh, joined uh, or accepted the gospel. But we don't necessarily see that uh, representing the Pauline letters, right? So artisans and craftsmen, especially if they employed others, they were part of the wealthier like I say, what we would might consider small business people these days. And so that was sort of a point to relatively prosperous, what we might call the middle class, very thin layer of a middling group in the Greco-Roman society after the elite who are really tremendously wealthy. So those are emperor's household, uh, emperor, emperor's household, uh, senators and equestrians and the Koreans, uh, city council members and those local sort of elites. But the common people, the plebs, comprise the relatively sort of a prosperous. And then the next sort of a level is a moderate surplus level who also, you know, some uh, merchants and artisans and small group artisans and then freed people. Yeah. And would you put, let's say, like Priscilla and Aquila would they be the artisans, would you say, maybe, or as tent makers, you know, would they have, would that be where they would be, do you think, or? Yeah, um, I I think so. They would be part of the, what Steve Friesen or um, Bruce actually would put a P5, a moderate, will have with now having a moderate surplus. And so because they actually work, they had their own means to support themselves and mobile. And then they were probably above the subsistence level. So when you go under that sort of a level, it's a least sort of a stable near subsistence or at subsistence level. So subsistence level is really barely making it to provide, I mean, to survive, to be self-sufficient in terms of, you know, food, housing, and then, the, you know, 
uh, clothing and so on. So I think that's where a lot of sort of a people uh, belong to. Probably maybe most of the Pauline community members belong there or above, slightly above subsistence level. So compared to the larger Greco-Roman sort of a population distribution, stable near the subsistence or at subsistence would be actually the majority of the Greco-Roman population where they actually belong to. So Paul's community, in a sense, represented probably the distribution of the population. Probably not. Uh, so the most destitute people, like uh, beggars or people with disabilities, and probably not part of the uh, the main part of the sort of Pauline communities, but those who are at sort of in a stable, uh, slightly above subsistence and subsistence level, they were probably part of that. Yeah. The majority of the Paul's communities, yeah, probably were. There. Yeah, thank you. As you were talking, I was imagining that overall, just about anybody in a Pauline church would be vulnerable. Vulnerable if they got sick, you know, if they injured themselves, breaking a bone could be fatal. If it didn't heal well or got infected, you know, there's no antibiotics. Childbirth was very dangerous at this time, and both for the infant and for the mother. And so I, I love how you've studied wealth and poverty and then written on illness, pain, and health care. And I can see how those, in a sense, naturally go together because healthcare requires resources and wealth and poverty is about resources. So you have this new book uh, published by Erdman's in 2022, Illness, Pain, and Healthcare in Early Christianity. What did you find about these categories of illness, pain, and overall healthcare? Can you give us a summary of, of your argument or your findings? Yeah, thank you. Uh, by the way, I appreciated that you actually connected the illness, sickness to a lack of resources. And going back maybe a little bit to, yeah, uh, as you were saying, indeed, the Pauline communities are comprised of mainly those people who are vulnerable. If anything goes wrong, if the crop fails or famine or you know, flooding or any kind of natural disaster. I mean, definitely their sort of uh, life's work or the everything will be affected. So they were living on the edge of simple vulnerability, definitely. Not only socioeconomic sort of vulnerability, but also physical vulnerability as well. So that's where the illness and pain sort of comes in. Since vast majority of people in the Roman Empire were part of that, constituted the vulnerable population, and the kinds of means available to them are basically their family members. Yeah. So if you don't have any family to care for you when you get sick, when you become unemployable and so on, and it's, it's a really pretty bleak sort of a situation that you will find yourself in. So my sort of a main point and argument in my most recent book is early Christians certainly participate in the larger Greco-Roman medicine market in the uh, plural sort of a uh, pluralistic markets of a uh, medical sort of uh, engagement uh, in the larger Greco-Roman context. And one of the points I argue is that the way Christians participated in the Greco-Roman medicine provided the distinct sort of a self-definition for Christians by understanding actually uh, healing, for example, religious healing as a part of medicine. Also, care for the sick is an active way that Christians actually engage their community and even the community outside their Christian sort of a community. So demonstrating care for the sick was uh, one of the identifiable factors for Christians, just as I argued in my previous book that caring for the poor was uh, one of the identifiable markers of Christian faith as well. So in this sort of a book, 
not only caring for the poor, but many, many times caring for the sick is very much ingrained in the Christian community ethos and practice, which also led to the medical charity, establishment of the medical charity through establishing hospitals, hostels, and uh, hospices. Those are uh, early Christian invention, if you will, in the late mid to late fourth century, and certainly motivated by this desire to care for the poor sick or the sick poor as sort of expression of uh, God's philanthropia, God's generosity in their communities. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so glad that you extended the conversation from wealth and poverty to thinking about health care and poverty, expanding maybe our understanding of poverty or the dimensions of poverty. Uh, your essay in the Dictionary of Paul and His Letters, the second edition, just is so helpful to think about how the, the apostle encouraged his communities to this generous mindset in, in all ways. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, from my reading of the New Testament, there's not a whole lot of emphasis on typing, I would say. But what's emphasized in Paul's letters is generosity, right? A generous sharing of resources. So I, I think that is actually a, a greater challenge because uh, our generosity presupposes actually that uh, we are tithing, uh, but generosity is on top of that. And um, the examples of, uh, you know, um, church in Corinth and Macedonia and Philippian churches and sort of uh, contributing even in their own poverty sort of provides a sort of an example for Paul, how we should be generous to each other and particularly to the poor who don't have those resources. Thank you, Dr. Helen Ree, for writing an excellent essay on wealth and poverty, but even now encouraging us in generosity. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Lynn. Uh, it's, a, it's been a privilege. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Behind the Books from IVP Academic. Join us next week when Scott McKnight chats with contributor Chris Hoklatubi. Behind the Books is a production of IVP Academic. For more information on any IVP titles mentioned in this episode, visit ivpress.com and use code IVPOD25. That's IVPOD25 for 25% off. Sound Engineering by Honest Podcasts. Our producers are Alexandra Horn and Travis Albertson. Our production assistants are Christine Policio Mello and Jack Reese. Our hosts are Scott McKnight, Lynn Kohick, Nijay Gupta, John Boyd, and Alexandra Horn. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts, and leave a rating and review to support the show.